Hi everyone, a very good afternoon. Thank you for joining us again in the second uh, Passport to Success series live talk today. Earlier today, we touched on the topics of business and management and how you can live your entrepreneurial passion and what are the steps and ways to get there. And uh, we had a really productive session. And for the second session of the day, uh, this is where I'm a little excited because this is a very interesting topic. This is a very, uh, you know, it's a topic that we need to discuss mm -hmm. Uh, particularly because the current generation, you know, what we are facing is um, there have been a lot of people that aren't uh, capable of managing their expenses. They do not know how to manage their debt. They, you know, people as, as young as 22 or 23 are getting their credit cards and spending without control. So all of this is basically going to be related to the topic of financial literacy. And uh, there will be a, a, a thorough discussion on you know how we as people can manage our own expenses, manage debt, and also you know if investment uh, is the best way forward. And of course, explaining on this topic uh, is one of our uh, renowned academics from Henley Business School. And uh, I would love to welcome for the very first time on our YouTube live session, mm. Dr. Yoki Yu Khan. Dr. Khan, Hello. thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Good Thank afternoon. You. Thank you for, for uh, agreeing to do the session and it's a, it's a pleasure to have you over. Uh, for all of you who are watching, uh, Dr. Khan um, actually brings with her a wealth of experience, um, having been an academic since the year 2004 uh, and of course been with Reading since 2015. Uh, even before that, uh, for eight years, she's actually worked in the corporate sector where she has been involved in the banking and security industry. So she does bring with her a solid grounding of the knowledge and applications and theories of, of financial practices, as well as uh, the, the knowledge of uh, being an academic, you know, an active researcher as well. So uh, to begin with, guys, uh, we will uh, dive in straight to the topic of the day. And uh, just to give you an idea of how we are going to do the talk is uh, Dr. Khan will explain about uh, the concepts, you know, and, and, and the ideas and the statistics uh, that she has um, put up for us. And uh, at the end of the session, of course, we will have a Q&A session. So for all of you viewers which are watching, feel free to type in your questions, any doubts that you have, and we will address them. And uh, we'll be happy to answer them. I'm, I'm sure Dr. Khan will be happy to address them as well. Now, um, Dr. Khan, shall I start by sharing screen for... Okay. So just please let me know if you are able to view this slide, Dr. Khan. Okay, so can I start now? Yes, you're most welcome. Uh, okay, uh, first of all, I would like to welcome everybody to the YouTube live session of University of Reading, Malaysia. Again, my name is Yoke Yi Khan. Today, the title of my presentation is Financial Literacy, The Route to Wealth. Have you noticed? there is a question mark in the title of the presentation, the route to wealth, question mark. Have you noticed that? Yes, ma'am, definitely noticed it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, our objective is to find out if financial literacy really leads to wealth. Yes or no? Well, we shall explore further. We all hope to be financially intelligent. What does financial intelligence mean in a world with so much uncertainty under a new normal? Does financial knowledge lead to a rich and fulfilling life? How can we build a successful career for our future? Well, the answer to these questions are truly not that straightforward. There may be more than one answer. No matter what type of career you pursue, from science to art to business, financial literacy is an essential skill for people from all backgrounds. I think this topic is timely and relevant at this point of time. The last two years was like no other. The COVID-19 pandemic plunged the world into a public health crisis that saw many losing their lives, their income, their livelihoods, our country, Malaysia, was not spared as the economy recorded a significant contraction. First of all, I would like to share with you some latest statistics 
about the current economic environment and financial situation in Malaysia in general. I believe by showing you real world data, research findings and empirical evidence, you should be able to see what is the problem and how to solve the problem and ultimately how to become financially secure and wealthy. That is my objective for this session. I'm going to show you a slide on GDP. Can you see the slide? A slide on GDP Malaysia. Can you see the slide? Yes, ma'am, it's a current one, right? Yes, you can see it, good. Great. So you can see from the slide that Malaysia record of negative 5.6% in year 2020 last year, as compared to 4.4% growth in 2019 before the outbreak of pandemic. So we moved from positive territory to negative growth rate. Up to the second quarter of this year, 2021, Malaysia's GDP rebounded by 16.1% after four consecutive quarters of contraction. However, the strong growth for the second quarter this year was also attributed to the low base recorded in the second quarter of previous year. <laughs> Despite the recovery in quarterly GDP, for the month of June, based on the latest statistic, GDP dropped again by 4.4% due to the resurgence of the COVID-19 pandemic and a nationwide lockdown. With tightened standard operating procedure, only essential services were allowed to operate since June, but I believe the situation should get better. Next, I'm going to show you a slide on unemployment rates. Unemployment rate can affect the, the wealth situation of many. How is the unemployment situation in Malaysia? Let's take a look at the recent unemployment rate. For year 2020, the unemployment rate was 4.5% as compared to 3.3% in 2019 before the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. If you look at the, the slide clearly, the unemployment rate of 4.5% in 2020 was a record high. If we compare to the Asian financial crisis in 1997 and global financial crisis experienced by the country in history, do you think 4.5% is higher than the past two crises based on the graph? Yes? I guess so, ma'am. Yep, yes, it is, it correct. Is pretty it's high. higher. Yes, it's at the highest record currently. So as of June 2021, the unemployment rate climbed to 4.8% as compared with 4.5% in May 2021 on a monthly basis. As we are still combating the rising number of new daily COVID-19 cases, the economy and labor market experience uneven recovery. Next, I'm going to show you another slide on how long can your saving last? This is an important and critical question. How long can your saving last? How long can average Malaysians sustain their living given the cur current uncertainty caused by the COVID-19 pandemic? According to a research published by Shaharuddin in 2021, 71.4% of Malaysians who are self-employed have savings that only can last for how long? If you look at the slide, how long the 71.4% of Malaysians can sustain their savings? Only four weeks. Yes, four weeks, that is a very big figure. And we have more statistics along the line, like 43% of individuals claim the saving would last less than two weeks, while only 28% had, had enough to last for two months. The survey also find that the majority of respondents say that they are unprepared. If the duration of the movement control order was extended, I'm going to show you another slide 
to answer a question on do Malaysian have enough emergency funds? Let's take a look at another slide. Do Malaysian have enough emergency funds? This is a study conducted by Look in 2015, even before the COVID-19 pandemic. More than 50% of Malaysians did not adequately plan for their financial emergency. Emergency funds should equal to at least three months living expenses. So what does the statistic tell us? Only about 35% of respondents in Penang and Klang Valley with low financial knowledge are well prepared for emergencies with emergency funds equivalent to at least three months of living expenses. All right, this figure is also very weak. Therefore, it is not surprising that the financial status of those people who do not save is significantly affected during the COVID-19 pandemic. The empirical statistics tell us an important lesson. If we do not prepare our finance during good time, we will not have the appropriate tool to cope with the problem when a crisis happens. I'm going to show you one more study by World Bank in 2019. Let's take a look at the next slide on a study by World Bank. Let me show you some critical information about the borrowing situation. According to the World Bank study in 2019, households with income below the living wage tend to take on personal financing, personal loan for consumption. Personal financing is widely used to keep up with lifestyle choices, which are considered discretionary consumption that provides an improvement in living standard beyond the basic necessity items. For example, spending on social activities, events, festive seasons. Households are increasingly turning to credit cards to make ends meet and frequently encountering challenges of overspending and poor debt management. There is an increasing concern about bankruptcy among the a uh, younger generation. If you see from the slide between 25 to 34 years old, millionaires spending beyond their income can be detrimental and lasting if they continue to lack financial knowledge and money management skills. All right, after analyzing some key statistics, I would like to share with you three key concepts, wealth, uh, well-being and financial literacy. A good understanding of this concept will enable you to view the world in a broader perspective and evaluate what is truly important to you. Uh, for wealth, uh, all right, it's not in the slide, okay? Uh, it's uh, something that I want to share with you. The, sure, the, doctor. The creation of wealth and prosperity are goals to which most people aspire. No matter what their current situation, they want to move higher up the ladder of financial success. The poor want to become financially secure, while the rich want to become richer. But does wealth solely mean money? What do you think, Nishan? Does wealth solely mean money? Definitely not, not doctor, because I think there's a lot of uh, mm. examples of wealth and health is one of them for me. Yes, correct. Uh, if we describe it from the wealth of nation perspective, the wealth of nation is the total amount of economically relevant public and private assets. The wealth of nation includes not only financial capital, but also physical, like natural resources, produce, human, health, education, family, relationship, friendship, even include social capital like trust, basic security, uh, effectively functioning rule of law, a relative corruption-free business environment, or a supportive uh, uh, business culture. 
decent education, for example, and healthcare. All right, healthcare is a form of wealth at this point of time. So, how is wealth related to well being? Does it mean that when you're wealthy, you have more money, uh, your well being is better? Uh, that would be an ideal situation. Okay, all right. If we were to define well being, well being actually involves a holistic evaluation of individual daily living conditions. All right, to determine whether or not people have a good quality of life. Well being includes happiness and life satisfaction. Happiness is closely related to emotions, feelings, and moods, while life satisfaction may include people connective evaluation and judgment about their life, for example, their work, their personal relationship. Uh, the in 1990, since 1990, the Human Development Index all right, was used as an alternative to GTP all right, because of its capacity to incorporate income, health, and educational outcomes. The non-economic indicators all right, include social capital, democratic governance, and human rights. So all these contribute to well-being. Uh, next, I would like to introduce another concept called financial literacy. What is financial literacy? This is the title of our topic today. Financial literacy is the ability to understand and apply the tools and processes associated with personal, business, corporate, or even government finances. Financial literacy includes a combination of financial knowledge and skill to make sound financial decision based on economic and personal circumstances. Knowledge means having an understanding of financial issues, markets, and instruments. Skill means being able to apply the knowledge. Is financial literacy the only factor contribute to wealth and financial well-being? What do you think? Do you think if you have financial literacy, you are guaranteed to wealth and well-being? I believe, Doctor, that we, we have already laid a proper foundation if we do have a proper financial literacy. Okay, good. I'm going to explore further on this. All right. So in line with the topic of the, the, the topic of this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the basic principles taught in university finance courses that may be useful for money management. All right, I'm going to show you a slide on asset and liability. Can you see a slide on asset versus liability? Yes, ma'am, clear. Okay, so one of the important concepts learned in fundamentals of accounting is about asset and liability. This concept is highly applicable in financial management. So, what are the key differences between an asset and liability? Something that put money in your pocket. Do you consider that as asset or liability? Something that puts money in your pocket. I, I've got to go with assets, ma'am. Yes, correct, asset. Huh? Asset is something that puts money in your pocket. Liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. The only way to become financially independent is to accumulate income generating asset that can pay for your expenses. Smart people diligently build their asset, such as saving, fixed deposit, mutual fund, stocks, bond, real estate, anything that can produce income or appreciate in value and has a ready market, that is assets. If you do not want money to control your life, uh, you will have to do things differently from the crowd. Let me quote an example. Buying the latest smartphone to keep up with the latest trend to enjoy on installment. All right, do, would you consider yourself having an asset or liability? Uh, definite liability. Yes, there is a liability. But if you buy a suitable phone for your children, 
to attend online class. It may be perceived differently. It could be an asset because you're investing in education. You're investing for the future of your children. So actually, uh, what, whatever you spend, you have to think about it from the perspective of asset and liability. All right. Uh, let me give you another example. I do not consider paying for education fees as spending. I consider that as an investment. Investment in human capital is a form of asset. Human is the greatest of all assets. And this human capital, the asset value can also grow over time. All right, I'm going to show you another slide on compounding, the power of compounding. So you see a red line and you see a blue line. Do you? Yes, ma'am, we do. We do see uh, two okay, lines. Okay, you can see the slide. So the x-axis is the time and the y-axis is the principal plus interest. Finance students learn about time value of money, simple interest, compound interest, present value, and future value. The idea behind compounding effect is simple but powerful. Compounding refers to the increase in value of an asset due to the interest on both principal and accumulated interest. Given time with consistent effort, with good investment habits, the payoff will eventually compound and return to us in an exponential rate. From the figure, you can see that the investment start to grow slowly and then accelerate as reflected in the stiff, stiffness of the read curve. So start saving and investment early in your life is important. Positive behavior and habits, no matter how small they are, given time will become a success, will become a success because of compounding effects. I'm going to show you another slide about concepts learned by finance students at university level. So we are going to see a slide on asset classes. Can you see cash, bonds, real estate, commodity, luxury investment and stocks? Yes, ma'am, we do. Yes, this, this uh, slide is about risk and return. All right, asset class is actually a grouping of investment instrument that exhibit similar characteristics. Students at university level learn about the detailed characteristic of each type of asset. There is always a trade-off between risk and return. According to the finance student, if you ask them, can risk and return be measured? Can risk and return be measured? Answer is? Uh, tough one, ma'am. I'm not a finance person, but, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go with yes. Yes, yeah, risk and return can be measured. We know that high risk, high return low risk, low return. And this concept is always true. Let me ask you another question. Which is riskier, real estate or bond? From the figure, let's take a guess. Uh, I'm going with real estate. Yes, real estate is more risky than bond. But do you think real estate will give us higher return? Uh, I'm guessing the simple logic is the higher the risk, the higher the return. Yes, true, Dishan, you are right. The higher the risk, the higher the return. So you have to understand uh, yourself as an investor. Can you afford to take risks? Do you have enough time to take risks? Do you have a long time horizon? If you are young, you can take more risks. But if you're about to retire, you better avoid stocks, all right? All the risky instrument, all right? Because the investment horizon, the time, time horizon for elderly people are shorter. They cannot afford to take risks. They cannot recover if they make a losses. So the higher the risk, the higher the return. Finance students also learn about asset allocation and diversification. Diversification means don't put all the eggs in one basket. All right, invest in different instruments because you can achieve better return eh, given the level of risk. These are things that is useful for personal financial management which finance students learn at university level. All right, after looking at this few slides, I'm going to talk about another concept called 
financial behavior. Just now I asked, and Nishan answered me, I asked about, uh, is financial literacy the sole factor to wealth? Do you think with financial literacy, you can become wealthy? I the think, answer, yeah, I think that lays, yes, yes it, it does uh, lay the foundation for it. Yes, but actually, according to research nowadays, we also study behavioral finance. There's another important factor, financial behavior. Financial behavior is equally important for wealth accumulation. One may have all the knowledge. However, if the attitude and behavior is not appropriate, one may run into financial problem. Financial behavior refers to human behavior relevant to money management. Common financial behaviors include cash management, credit management, saving and investment. Financial behavior are not outcomes because they only contribute partly to the outcomes. Outcome results from a person's own behavior and many other factors along the way. For example, a husband may want to increase his family saving. Okay, a husband may want to increase his family saving, but it may not be possible if his wife wants to spend all the income or if his child has a medical emergency that requires spending all the income. Therefore, behavior should lead to outcomes. Another example is saving money regularly is a behavior, all right? But increase in the total saving is an outcome. Saving money regularly leads to increased saving given other factors, all right? That is the situation. So financial behavior is another important factor. Uh, behavior can be positive, can be negative. Uh, we all understand uh, very easily, all right? Saving is a good behavior, all right? Reducing debt, paying back your debt as quickly as possible is a good behavior. Avoid undesirable risky investment, all right? A risky investment could include uh, gambling in the stock market, for example. Those are not good behavior. So behavior play an important role. There are more and more research study that study human behavior, all right? Instead, some of the Nobel Prize winner in finance, uh, they study human behavior. important. Um, uh, next, I would like to share with you another survey uh, by World Economic Forum. We know that we are currently living under the new normal after the outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. All right, so what can we expect going forward? This is a study conducted by World Economic Forum. All right, this title is about planned business adaptation in response to COVID-19. I'm going to show you this because uh, we, can ex we can predict uh, what will affect our future and how should we uh, prepare ourselves. The change to business practice brought about by the pandemic are likely to further entrench a whole new way of working, even to earn a living. We will not see a return back to normal, but will instead see a return to a new normal. <laughs> All right. Employers are set to accelerate their job automation, according to the World Economic Forum survey in 2020. Among the business leaders survey, over 80% report that they are accelerating the digitalization of their work process and expanding the use of remote work. For example, digital tools and video conferencing. A significant 50% also indicate that they are set to accelerate the automation of jobs in their company. In addition, more than one quarter of employers expect to temporarily reduce their workforce. And this is serious. It can affect many people. And one in five expect to permanently do so. That means the staff are retrenched. In certain industries, the staff are retrenched totally, permanently. 
for example, in the tourism industry, in the airlines. So how can we adapt ourselves? I'm going to show you the next slides on technologies likely to be adopted. This is from the same survey from World Economic Forum. Because of the business adaptation, new technologies are likely to be adopted. According to the same survey, we can see encryption, cybersecurity, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, internet of things, robots, distributed ledger technology, blockchain, uh, there are many jargons here. All right, I'm still learning also uh, with all these new technology. These technologies are becoming a mainstay of work across industry. How would digital technology transform our lives? We are going through perhaps the most exciting period in the modern history of financial services. Let me ask you a question. From the moment we wake up to the last thing we do at night, do you think we touch our handphone? Probably a hundred times a day, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> True. From the moment we wake up early in the morning until before we go to sleep, technology is transforming our lives. After the outbreak of pandemic, the past one and a half year have seen rapid technological change that has fundamentally shifted the boundaries of human possibility, enabling radical improvements in productivity. We can be very productive even if we stay at home, for example. We see new advances, improvement in efficiency. We cut down on traveling time and become more efficient. All right, we can cook and work at the same time at home. We can do many things, all right. So we also can have new ways of communication within the society. Digital technology is creating new opportunity for connecting customer and opening new channels to market, uh, transforming the core tenets of competitiveness for every industry. It even revolutionized the workplace, all right, and reframed the definition of what a successful business is. Okay, so these changes have created new opportunities for business. The business that are prepared and able to adapt faster to this change will reap the reward. So my point is, what I want to highlight is, if we can ride on the current wave and offer products and services that are needed by the society in the face of the change, I believe we are not very far away from the route to wealth. Do you agree with me? I think definitely, ma'am. I think there is a, a lot of learning to do in this area, but you know, uh, with guidance, uh, with the right amount of uh, information and training, I think everyone can actually achieve a certain level of financial literacy and also wealth as well. Good. I think learning about fintech, all right, is important at this point of time. What is fintech? Fintech is the merger of two words. What are the two words? Would you like to take a guess? Uh, I'm going to go with a guess, ma'am, and that is Fing financial yes. technology. Yes, financial technology. Good. Fintech means financial technology. So it's a marriage between the financial services and technology sector. All right, where te technology centric startup innovate the products and services traditionally offered by financial institutions. Sometimes we call this disruptive innovation. All right, so I'm going to show you another slide on key areas of fintech. Fintech has become a hot term due to the driving forces, all right, because we are adapting to new normal. There are many key areas about fintech, uh, for example, crowdfunding, blockchain, uh, these are the things that our students learn at the university level, and this knowledge is highly useful. We see that in future, they may not have lifelong employment. They may need entrepreneurship uh, skills, just like what highlighted by my colleagues, Dr. T, this morning. All right, we cannot expect lifelong employment. We are preparing our students to face a future that we do not know how it will turn out to be. But... I think if we get hold of the current trend and start looking at this direction, 
then there will be opportunity, all right, new job opportunity, new business model. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, regulatory technology, because fintech need to be regulated. There is a specialization, all right, that study the regulatory perspective, all right, using technology to regulate banking industry, for example, and mobile payment apps. I think most people are good with online shopping nowadays. Uh, data analytics, big data, P2P lending means peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, from one person to another without going through the financial institution. We even have robo-advisor, artificial intelligence. Uh, all right, have, have you come across sometimes the right advertisement will appear in your Facebook. It seems like Facebook know what you like. Definitely. Yes. It, it, it is a scary experience, but uh, hmm. but yeah, I, I've actually experienced that. Uh, yeah, so that is artificial intelligence. Computer will be analyzed, will be able to analyze our behavior. And data monetization is another area. We can even sell data to make money if we have a pool of data. So I... I think uh, that is my sharing for the time being. Uh, finally, we have come to the last slide. All right, before I bid goodbye to you, I'm going to show you one slide on good financial plan. All right, because our title is, how can we uh, uh, go up the route of wealth? <laughs> All right, a financial plan is a map that helps you to understand what you have now. All right, we want to be better uh, day by day. Yeah? We do not want to deteriorate. From poor to rich is not that difficult. From rich, going back to poor is a true suffering. So we need to know uh, what we have now, where we, where we want to go, where we want to be, how you will be there. All right. So a good financial plan is very important. A good financial plan may have a few basic components. Uh, for example, if we start off our life, we need to plan for education. We need to equip ourselves with knowledge, skills, and ability. I always believe that education is the best form of investment. And I live by that belief. Huh? All right. And after we have good education, we can have good earning power and income. Before we even start saving, the most important plan is risk management. For example, buying insurance. Instead, the less financially secure you are, the more important is insurance. Then we must plan to save for emergency. Uh, save first before we spend. All right. Uh, if you can draw up a budget, if there is a need to use loan to buy big items like property, we need to plan the repayment and manage our credit well. Of course, investment is important since interest rate is very low nowadays. We must learn about the different characteristics of investment and diversify our portfolio. Along the way, continuous lifelong education is important as we no longer have a lifelong employment. We need to plan for sudden shift in job and adapt our ability. And lastly, planning for retirement is essential. We could have delayed our gratification or enjoyment to work, to work hard when we are young. So having a financially independent retirement should be an important part of our planning. Start planning early and you will definitely reap the reward due to the power of compounding. Uh, the financial plan for individual is personal designed to map an individual path between your current position and your unique end goal. Uh, that's all my sharing. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Dr. Khan, thank you very much for providing us insight. I think there's a lot of things that I didn't know before this, you know, and, and we think we know what financial literacy mm -hmm. is. And then uh, there's the, so much more to learn about the topic mm -hmm. itself, you know, and, and the points that you highlighted, you know, uh, debt management and, and risk management, as well as um, saving up mm, yes. and planning ahead for your future, as well as retirement yes. and so on. Mm. Now, doctor, I do have mm. a few questions. Uh, and I've gone through this mm. uh, before. I, I'm pretty sure that you might have mm. gone through this as well. Mm. Uh, when 
at, at the early stages of my working career, mm. I, I often noticed that there would be a lot of advertisements, a lot of mm. uh, people, bankers especially, mm. that are encouraging you to, to mm. take up a credit card. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and your income may not be that high. You know, it's, yeah. it's just the first one or two years of working. And sometimes you see mm -hmm. a lot of ads uh, giving add-ons. You know, if you sign up for this credit card, mm -hmm. you're going to get a pair of iPod, uh, iPods mm -hmm. or maybe, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a traveling suitcase mm -hmm. or stuff. So uh, how or what would your advice be for, for youth, especially those, your graduating students, for instance, uh -huh. those who are going on to the yeah. job market, you know, they are going to be, uh, you know, competitive. Mm. They are competitive students. They're going to be uh, earning um, good money. And at the same time, mm. there's all these, uh, I would say, these uh, distractions mm. and these uh, temptations around them to, to mm. get things that, you know, such as a credit card, which may not always be mm. the best uh, decision mm. to make. So what would your advice be for them? You know, is, a, is mm. something like a credit card necessary for someone that's just starting off their jobs? And, and how mm. can they actually mm. protect themselves from that temptation? Uh, maybe I would answer the question this way. Would you like to know whether I have a credit card? Uh, I yep. think that could be the best answer. I personally do not use a credit card. I have a debit card, a bank ATM card. Uh, okay. I think that one should live within their means because if you use credit card, you really need to use prudently and ensure that you pay on time. The interest rate is very high. As we can see from the research from the World Bank 2019, youngsters get into yes. bankruptcy yeah, because of credit card personal spending. Nowadays, there are a lot of concept, a lot of study on compulsive purchase. Uh, compulsive purchase by youngster. They spend money without control. So uh, I don't use a credit card. I believe that nowadays with technology, with a smartphone, with a mobile banking system, uh, instead credit card is losing its market share due to fintech. So okay. I don't use a credit card. I mean, that's interesting. I never knew that. I thought credit cards were still... Uh, you know, a thing, you know, uh, but, but yeah, mm -hmm. judging from the amount of online um, applications yes. that we have right now, mm -hmm. you know, especially those to make payments mm -hmm. where you don't need to carry cash mm -hmm. and what more during a pandemic right now, we don't want to be, you know, touching things mm -hmm. and, and, you know, using the phone to pay mm -hmm. is, is just the easiest way to do so. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's very interesting that you as a working mm -hmm. adult, you know, and having had tons of experience working mm -hmm. in two different types of industry, you're mm -hmm. not using a credit card. And, and that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think a lot of mm -hmm. people should uh, uh, be, be making the right decision. You know, they mm -hmm. should be, as you said, prudent when it comes to spending and not fall victim to the temptations mm -hmm. yes. of, of the banks that say, okay, you know, sign mm -hmm. up, get a credit card. Uh, I think it, it, it's only if you really need it, mm -hmm. then you get it. If you don't, then, you know, just, just do or practice what you are already using, which is the financial technology or the debit card mm -hmm. uh, simply. So thank you. Thank you for, for giving us insight on that, Dr. Khan. Mm -hmm. um, as we move forward, Dr. Khan, we also, um, as you highlighted, mm -hmm. compulsive spending. Yes. The, you know, right now, especially during the pandemic, mm -hmm. we are seeing a, a huge rise in, mm -hmm. in online shopping. You know, people can't go mm -hmm. to their uh, mm -hmm. uh, stores in person to, to mm -hmm. try out the outfits or the products mm -hmm. or, or even gadgets, and they need mm -hmm. to purchase it online. But how do they draw the line? You know, it, it is, in fact, rather tempting for everyone to, you know, it, it's even for me to just view things on, online and see, oh, okay, this is the latest mm. stuff, this is the latest shoes or something. Mm. But uh, how would you recommend the youngsters to, to control themselves, you know, with all these ads that are being thrown at mm. them and all these, uh, you know, 8-8 eight, eight shopping spree and on Shopee and everything? How, how do you mm. go about it on your, on your spending? Uh. A good way is every month when you receive your monthly salary, if you're employed, uh, okay. if you're employed, you receive your monthly salary, you start paying all the essential bills first, then save money, force yourself to save, force yourself to save, then the balance you can use happily in whatever way you want. So I technically make myself very poor towards the end of the month because by end of the month, I do not have much to spend because a big chunk of my income is saved right at the moment when I receive my uh, monthly salary. Okay. So now it's close to one end, so I'm technically poor. But I, I ensure that I save enough 
okay. uh, I think there's no secret. I save enough to uh, invest in education. Uh, invest in education. I believe education is a good form of investment. So I keep a big chunk of my money every month so that I can pay you know, at the end of the year for education fees for the next generation. Uh, so this is a way to force yourself to become poor, technically poor, all right? Then okay. you won't overspend. <laughs> okay, that's, that's very interesting. Maybe it's a good strategy. Mm. I think it is. I think a lot of people, um, as, as how uh, we, we've seen mm. uh, interviews and, and, and quotes by some mm. of the top uh, investment experts in the world, mm. uh, you know, Warren Buffett or, or mm. um, you know, the, the, mm. the founders of the big e-commerce platforms, you know, all say that, you know, people... Yeah go broke trying to look rich. Uh, and more yes. often than not, the top brands that we see mm. are often targeting not the rich, mm. but actually the middle class, you know, people mm. who are easily uh, tempted mm. into spending, mm. those who want to look rich, but they aren't actually as secure mm. as you would expect them to be. So, you know, then comes the spending of, of you know, buying a very fancy car, mm. you know, fancy shoes or bags mm. and stuff. Uh, of course, you, you deserve to buy what you, work for, but not at a point where you are being put to debt. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important to, to understand. Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it is also uh, interesting the way you put it to say that, you know, every month you, you actually force mm -hmm. yourself to save. Yes. But from, uh, 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 from your point of view, as say, what would your advice be for the youngsters who, you know, how much mm -hmm. should they save? What is the ideal amount? Is there sort of a percentage? Mm -hmm. Say if someone mm. was uh, on a salary of, of mm. say, 3,000 ringgit a month, what would the uh, ideal number of savings be for that particular person? Uh, I have some statistic from uh, Bank Negara Malaysia on living wage. For someone who are single who live in KL, the living wage uh, to be able to rent a place, uh, uh, afford yep. transportation, mobile yes. phone, some minimal entertainment is 2007. Bring it Malaysia. So if a fresh graduate is earning within that 2007, then it's not easy for them, of course. But if they are yep. married with two uh, with couples, the living wish is 4,005. And if uh, a family with husband and wife and two children, the living wish is 6,500. So okay. uh, the income must be 6,500 in order to support two children at a very minimal level. This is a study conducted by Bank Negara Malaysia. So uh, we have to plan out accordingly because ultimately money is never enough for everybody. All right, how we look at wealth, uh, it could be different. Some people perceive children as a form of wealth. All right, some people perceive that uh, happiness uh, is cannot be purchased with wealth, for example. So we have to plan and have a certain objective in mind. For example, some people like to go for holiday. Some would like to further their education, study for master, for example. As long as you have a clear a goal, you know that is what you want to achieve and you set up a plan, all right? By the time you achieve uh, what you aim for, you will be very happy. Everybody have different needs, all right? So, Set up your aims, your goals, and plan accordingly. That is what financial plan is all about. It seems very easy, but it's not easy to practice because uh, human behavior, <laughs> behavioral finance, play okay. an important role in everything. The True, ma'am. I've got to agree. Yeah. I think the... the we know the, how to do it, but we cannot control ourselves. Self-control is also being studied in... The literature, because I look at the literature, the research study, nowadays there is a cross-disciplinary study between finance and psychology, because psychology, psychology play an important role in influencing the stock market, all right, people are not rational all the time. It's true, ma'am, I've got to agree, I think the, yes. the approach used by uh, the, the big brands, you know, the, the clothing mm. brands and, and the, uh, the car companies yes. and, and the uh, consumers, you know, mm. I think they really uh, take a very mm. strong psychological uh, approach to their marketing ads. Mm. And in the end, people uh, actually get hooked onto it. And, and, and you know, mm. there's this constant reminder on the apps and so on right now. Mm. And it just tempts people into spending for mm. things that they don't really need to have. Mm. Uh, and I've got to agree. Um, I think 
the, the study of, of psychology and finance mm -hmm. uh, is, is very, very crucial to um, people understanding how the consumer works. Uh, hence, it, it's down to us to actually not uh, fall victim or fall prey to that, mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the mind games. And I think marketing mm -hmm. is, is always down to mind mm -hmm. games. It's yes, not really about correct. the product, mm -hmm. but it's down to mind games. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't get caught up in that um, in that uh, situation. Yes. So, uh, Doctor, as as we move on, mm -hmm. I think there's, mm -hmm. there's time for probably one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm looking at the chat now. Uh, I don't see any inquiries just yet. Now, we do have at... Um, the University of Reading mm. and University of Reading Malaysia, mm -hmm. a program that uh, you have uh, you yourself have been teaching mm -hmm. in, uh, which is in fact uh, one of the more popular programs that we have, and and it's in finance and business management. Uh, so, how would going through that program be mm -hmm. beneficial for students? You know, there are a lot of finance programs in the country uh, mm -hmm. who, who take different approaches and so on. Of course, for us, we take a very different approach. Uh, even as what Dr. T was explaining mm -hmm. earlier today, you know, HPS has a different approach where there's more hands-on mm -hmm. learning. But mm -hmm. from your point of view, what is the benefit of, of studying finance and business management? Uh, you mean studying at University of Reading? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Uh, uh, in general, I think the standard uh, of University of Reading is higher than um, most of the local institution because I have taught in local institution before. Okay. I think our standard is pretty high. From first year, even in year one, in introductory finance, students study from time value of money, the principles, all the way to stock bonds and derivative. Huh? Not many, um, not many institution uh, uh, teach uh, derivative in first year, but our students are learning, all right? Okay. So uh, by the time when they're in third year, uh, when most universities offer derivative uh, subject in third year, by the time our students are in third year, they are already sitting in front of the dealing room, learning how to manage risk, how to trade derivative. So this is the uniqueness that I encountered when I first joined University of Reading Malaysia five six years ago. Uh, in terms of technology, we, we, we are more at once because we are supported by ICMA, International Capital Market Association. We have a dealing room. Uh, students have hands-on experience on trading. All right, I also learned the trading strategy uh, okay. six years ago, six years ago when I first joined the university. All right. I also learned about uh, a lot of new technology, new software. All right. Uh, for example, Understood. in portfolio optimization using computer, using Excel, uh, we don't do hand counting that often. We use uh, computer, all right, to solve more complex financial problem. So, and another uniqueness is we have a subject called risk management in third year. All right, risk management is very important nowadays because we must know how to protect ourselves. Risk management seems to study the worst case scenario. What is the maximum losses that we will incur under the worst scenario? So okay. we must learn how to manage risk for a bank, for example. Otherwise, the bank can collapse due to a crisis. All right, so risk management has become an important topic. On top of that, uh, FinTech is also added to the syllabus. FinTech okay. is the cost for the future. All right, it's forward looking. Uh, this is the unique note that that's, I found in University of Reading Malaysia syllabus. Awesome, ma'am. I think summarizing from what you have just explained to us, it's it's not only uh, the, the the learning part. I think it's also a uh, hands-on approach mm. that students get. You yes. know, with the trading simulation, with mm. the uh, modules that they are, mm. are taking in year one, two, and three. Yes. Uh, and at the same time, uh, when you spoke about risk management mm. and you spoke about fintech, I think. Mm. Future students, you know, those who are pondering, you know, if you should start mm -hmm. off learning uh, or doing a degree in finance and business management, I think that pretty much explains that we are producing industry-ready mm -hmm. graduates. You know, we are producing mm -hmm. people for the future. And, yes. and that's how you are. You are actually going to be uh, one of the more unique graduates in, in the future where you have uh, a more hands-on approach. Mm -hmm. You know, you are a problem solver and you have the knowledge and you are also more adaptable mm. in that sense. So 
that's actually awesome, Dr. Khan. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Khan, I still do not see any um, questions here in the live mm -hmm. chat. Um, I would love to uh, thank you for spending your mm -hmm. Saturday afternoon with us and giving us awesome insight into financial literacy mm -hmm. as well as you know how we can mm -hmm. uh, manage ourselves so that wealth uh, mm -hmm. we can achieve you know wealth a certain level of wealth as we go on with our lives you know as we mature uh, and and not end up as as people who have actually uh, you know become bankrupt or broke mm -hmm. in the future so I think that's very mm -hmm. very piece of um, crucial skill that mm -hmm. everyone should have uh, Dr. Khan thank you once mm -hmm. again and for the viewers thank you for joining our talk mm -hmm. as well Dr. Khan, any, any last uh, advice? Before before I end this session, I would okay. like to uh, wish all the audience to have a financial independence in future. I hope mastering finance is uh, awareness to you. Mastering finances is, finances is important because it has a drastic impact on how you want to get to live your life and when you get to live it. So the more skill you have with handling money, uh, the less financial mistake you will make and you can achieve the dream that you want to. Awesome, ma'am. So I, I think wish you all the that's, best. That's that's awesome piece of advice, you know, and also um, for the um, A-level and STPM and IGCSE mm -hmm. levers that have completed mm -hmm. your exams uh, just a couple of weeks back and you receive your mm -hmm. results, you know, congratulations to you. Mm -hmm. uh, just for your information, the University of Reading will have its intakes upcoming intakes for foundation in the month of uh, end of this month on 30th August, but you still do have time to register uh, as the enrollment uh, period will be open for about 14 days after that date. Mm -hmm. And it's the same, we also have the degree intake coming up on the 20th of September, which will begin with the welcome week. So you still have time to apply, you still have time to consult with us. Just keep in touch with us. Uh, we'll be happy to give you uh, insight. There is the general line as well as the email addresses. So uh, it's all available on our Facebook page as well as YouTube as well. After the video is ended, there will be a description in which you can get in touch with us. Until then, guys, please stay safe, take care of yourselves. And you know, uh, thank you very much for joining the session. So Dr. Yukan, thank you very much as well. Thank you. See you soon, ma'am. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Goodbye.